please join me in a word of prayer before I begin. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for gathering us this morning as your church, as your body, as your assembly to give honor and praise and thanks to you through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to always keep Christ at the center of our minds. May Christ be at the center of all that we do and think. And Lord, may Christ be on our hearts as we reflect on your message this morning. Amen. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. As someone who grew up as what most would call a Southern Baptist, or perhaps evangelical is a pretty common phrase. Uh, some have asked me what gave me such an appreciation for more traditional or liturgical worship, uh, like we celebrate here at Grace. How did I go from playing bass guitar uh, in a worship band every Sunday uh, to wearing this and chanting the litany uh, on Sunday mornings? It's a fair question. Uh, and there's a lots of ways I could answer that question, uh, but for the sake of time and uh, so that Terry doesn't kick us out at 11 o'clock, um, I'll stick to uh, just one of my answers uh, to that question. Um, I was drawn to the liturgy primarily because every detail of the liturgy, if you pay attention, uh, points us to Jesus Christ. If you think about it, our morning liturgy begins um, with us gathering uh, from the world um, as separate individuals coming together as one body under one mutual confession. We confess that we are sinners, we've sinned against God and our neighbor, and that not just in our actions, but in our thoughts, in our words, and in our deeds, we have transgressed the law. Each of us stand in judgment, guilty of leaving the path of righteousness for our own desires. And if we deny this, then the truth is not in us. Yet through this confession... And through the following announcement of good news that God has given his son to die and rise for us. We are directed in our hope to his authority and to his sacred promise that repentant hearts are truly forgiven in Christ. As Paul directs us in Ephesians, we respond to this good news with a hymn of praise. While we lift up our voices and worship the cross is led to the altar as a sign of Christ's entrance into our midst. The scripture says, when two or three or 30 are gathered together in my name, the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, there I am in the midst of them. Our song becomes a song of petition with the great litany when we sing, Lord, have mercy. Where we ask God to not only have mercy on us, but upon others in the church and throughout the whole world. Before we even sing glory to God or this is the feast, the liturgy has exposed us to five different books of the Bible. What may seem rote or boring routine to others is in fact over time impressing Holy Scripture on each of us and how we think about our worship and how we think about God. But let us continue. We have lifted our prayers to God, and now it is time for God to speak to us through his word, Holy Scripture. God communicates his will and his desire for us through the reading of Holy Scripture in the congregation of believers. And through this word, he reminds us anew of the promise of mercy laid before those who confess that they are sinners. On high feast days, it's customary to have a gospel procession into the center of the church, where we carry the book of Holy Scripture into the aisle and read the gospel in the midst of the assembly. Now, what this does is it emphasizes the reality of John 1, that the word in eternity, the word that was present at creation with God, is dwelling with its people. But with or without a procession, we stand at the gospel reading to give a particular attention to the word once delivered to the apostles and now delivered to us through a reader. This is why a sermon's purpose is to continue pointing the assembly to Jesus Christ. 
A sermon that ends with, you must do this or that to receive mercy. Or until you feel a certain way, you cannot come to the altar. All this does is point to ourselves, our own effort, and our own works. All that's revealed by doing this is pointing out our own sin, our own inability to live up to the law, our own desperation for a savior. We need Christ because we cannot obey the law on our own. As my favorite Baptist Charles Spurgeon once said, is there no Christ in your sermon, preacher? Then go home and don't preach until you have something worth preaching about. May the preaching from this pulpit never direct us anywhere but to Jesus Christ. Now, after joining in prayer again, we customarily uh, pass the peace. Now, under COVID uh, restrictions, this looks quite a bit different. Uh, But there is a temptation to treat this like a a time to meet and greet uh, session. Uh, And while it's a good time to get reconnected with one another and catch up on the past week, uh, we pass the priest primarily uh, to reconcile with our brothers and sisters in Christ before Holy Communion takes place. Paul warns in the New Testament that there should be no division among those who celebrate Holy Communion together. In the Byzantine tradition, the custom during Lent is to say to each person before Holy Communion, uh, brother or sister, I've sinned against God and I've sinned against you. To which the person replies, brother or sister, God forgives you, and I forgive you. That is the weight that peace be with you is meant to carry as we pass it amongst ourselves. And after the passing of the peace, we are led to the summit of the liturgy. We come before the altar of God as we celebrate Holy Communion as a church. All attention is directed to the body and blood of our Lord. Much like the shame that he experienced on the road to Calvary, his coverings are removed and his body and blood is exposed on the altar for all to see. As was the will of God the Father, his body is broken for the forgiveness of sins. This is where heaven meets earth and table fellowship with God is granted to us through Christ. We approach the altar with nothing to offer, nothing but empty hands as we receive the fruit of the cross, our tree of life. We return back to the assembly with the peace of God, knowing with certainty that we have taken and ingested the mercy of God into our very being through the bread and the cup. Finally, we thank God for this tremendous gift and once again join in a song of thanksgiving As the processional cross leaves our midst, we are reminded of our obligation to follow Christ into the world and to seek his presence there. For where the hungry are fed, where the poor are clothed, and where the sick are taken care of, there is Christ to be taken care of also. But this carries with it a double meaning because we are also called to represent Christ In the world, as the Great Commission teaches, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. The cross leaves our midst, and we follow the cross into the world, representing Christ, but also seeking Christ in those we serve. As you can see, every detail of the liturgy directs us to the life and promises of Jesus Christ. And while this doesn't suggest that the liturgy makes our worship more holy than everyone else's or somehow more pleasing to God than others, it does reflect the church's historic method of staying focused on Jesus that has stood the test of time from generation to generation. We are called to remind ourselves and to focus our attention to Christ always to the midst of calm seas or stormy waves. And I'm sure we can all agree that from the beginning of 2020, we've experienced our fair share of stormy waves. 
Of course, it's easy to stand up here and speak about fixing our attention on Christ. But there are those of us in the church who have lost family members to COVID-19. Those of us in the church who have suffered racial injustice and have been broken this past year by the division. And there are those of us in the church who have become the victim of a violent protest of some kind. There's an old saying in the Navy that smooth waves never made a skilled sailor. Now, this saying suggests that sailors really learn their craft. They learn to hone their talents only when they are forced to do it under difficult circumstances. Calm seas can't teach a sailor how to navigate under difficult circumstances. So then the question is, what is the craft of the church? What is the talent that is being honed in the midst of this storm? Our craft, brothers and sisters, is to teach ourselves and to teach others how to rely on Jesus Christ above all else at all times. If we're being swallowed by the waves, we shout to the one who tramples the waves, crying, Lord, save me. Even when the seas are calm and things are going well, we must also confess, Lord, you must save me. The waves of our current climate are teaching us to reach out to Christ anew. Reminding us of who loves us enough to reach down and save us from death. The one who pulls us from the great waters out of the depths into his saving embrace. We rely on his body, the church. We rely on his promise that there is more than the life of sorrow we now face. That one day, every tear will be wiped away. And that one day all will have their bodies restored in his perfect body. May we be surrounded by reminders of the Son of God that direct us not to fear the danger of the waves in front of us, but to trust in his promises ahead of us, the promises of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.